G'day, guys. Thanks for joining us on the New Sparrow podcast today. You're joining Turbo and I in studio along with our partner, spearfishing.com.au, who have helped us bring this show to you today. Now, you can use the code NoobSpear at checkout at spearfishing.com.au to save $20 on all purchases over $200. That goes along with competitive shipping rates worldwide and a 90-day no-hassles returns policy. You can also visit Adreno in their physical stores in Melbourne, Sydney, or Brisbane and just check out a huge range of spearfishing equipment. So shop with our sponsors, spearfishing.com.au, and support the Noob Spiro podcast. G'day and welcome to the Noob Spiro Podcast. Turbo here. This week's episode is an absolute cracker. We speak with Grant Laidlaw all the way from Scotland. This is one of the uh, one of the funner interviews I think we've ever done. So uh, we speak to Grant all about the conditions in Scotland, and uh, he shares some excellent stories on diving at night in Scotland and a few of his mishaps and near misses. So very entertaining stuff. Uh, we also speak to Grant about pneumatic spear guns, um, some of their pros and cons, and a few of his tricks and tips for improving their uh, power and accuracy. So um, really interesting stuff there. Haven't thought too much about pneumatic spear guns, but um, Grant gives us the lowdown on pneumatic spear guns. So stay tuned for that. All right, so before we get into it, I just want to say a quick thank you to Chris Schlenner. Chris, uh, thanks for the words of encouragement, mate. Uh, we're definitely going to stick to uh, the podcast and keep them coming. Um, Lance Summer, g'day to you over in Monterey Bay. Um, and thanks to everyone that wrote us a review or left us a five-star review on Amazon for 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. That stuff, re- those reviews really help us. So uh, yeah, keep them coming. Um, Greg, thank you for your review. He wrote a very quick read with some of the most important tips. If you have a trip coming up, read this first because it has some great reminders well thanks greg it's uh, it is a quick read because we can barely read ourselves so um thank you for your review so without further ado here it is over to grant laidlaw and trek i wanted to share awesome experiences that you can have when you are in the water and that's why I started spearfishing. I just clamped down on the reel and got drugged down to about 50 feet. And I'd never had a battle like that before in my life. But when you're learning where to hunt and find fish, they're the hot spots. It's where fish want to be. Don't overcomplicate your gear. Don't go diving dressed up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> I actually started off in stubbies with a bloody belt with a pig knife on it. And they've seen this big fin break the surface, roll into the water, look down. Here's this nice big great white. Oh, oh, oh. Once your face hits the water and you feel relaxed, and all the other stresses of life seem to disappear. It's a whole new world and it's mysterious, it's magical. Beats the shit out of knitting anyway. Oh yeah. G'day Noob Spiro listeners, today we are chatting with Grant Laidlaw. We've been trying to get him on the show for a while. He is a Scottish spearfishing character. When we started um, sort of having back and forth exchanges, it quickly became apparent that we were going to have a good laugh with Grant. It's good to be chatting with you today, Grant. Good, mo- good morning over there, I believe. Yeah, good morning, and uh, thanks for the invite. It's good to good to finally speak to you. Well, Grant, why don't you tell us, uh, mate, because we know nothing about spearfishing in Scotland, um, so why don't you tell us all about how you got started and uh, and what it's like over there in uh, sunny old Scotland? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sunny Scotland. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I, I kind of I started rod fishing probably when I was about five years old, really in local local rivers and all the rest of it, and I did a bit of snorkeling. Uh, I'd never spear fished, but I was I was just fishing mad, um, and I studied fish farming and ended up having the choice of going to work in Tasmania or South Africa, um, and wow. I, I decided to go out to South Africa. Um, okay. And the reason I did that was I really wanted to catch a catch a great white shark at the time for some reason. Um, so <laughs> a, about a, oh, I guess about a week later, I found myself in a little a little wooden boat out in Hans Bay, uh, attached to a four hundred kilogram great white shark, and uh, <laughs> it, it was a bit surreal because I was watching these people swimming on the beach, and I was wishing I really wasn't in this little boat because this shark was taking lumps out the side of the boat. There was wood flying everywhere, and I was really sort of out my Comfort zone a little bit. I'd never seen anything like it. Um, and at that point, I had been quite keen on getting into spearfishing or diving out in South Africa, but I just thought, absolutely not a chance after seeing that. There's no way I'm going to even swim <laughs> in the beaches here. <laughs> so um, yeah. I, I got to know a lot of crayfish and ab divers out there, but but really, I just thought they were off their bloody trolleys going into that water with those fish. 
Um, so I came home oh, five, six years later, and and I slowly got into into spear fishing here. Um, it took me it took me a few years to actually get get any use of it. The, the, the equipment you couldn't buy equipment here. There's no shops. There's no uh, there wasn't anybody else <laughs> spear fishing that I was aware of. So I did the usual and yeah. just started with uh, really crap gear, just inappropriate gear. Um, slowly, yeah. slowly got into the sport from there. I I read when I was first reaching out to you, you said, my first eight or nine years, I'd never heard of anyone else doing spearfishing, but now there's a fair few other idiots getting in. (laughs) I thought that was hilarious. I think there's definitely a scene starting to grow here. Um, Ah, it's good. Yeah, and and I think um, it's, it's... it looks like I think this year's been a really big year for it. I think next year there'll be even more people getting into it. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of people do it through the summer, it looks like to me. We're, we're, me and my mates tend to be doing it, um, or we try and do it all year if we get the conditions, but um, often often the swell just stops you getting out there. And it, it, winter diving is it's hard. It's pretty it's pretty miserable, really. I don't know why we do it sometimes, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it can be done all year. Okay, so when you did sort of start spearfishing in Scotland, like what were some of the obstacles and issues you had? You sort of said there's not many other people doing it. You couldn't get equipment. What other sort of dramas did you run into? Um, just the usual, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. So, so I, I bought a surf suit off eBay, a secondhand surf suit, and it was too small for me. Yeah, I've still got it in my shed. I still have a laugh at it when I see it, but uh, <laughs> I think it was two sizes too small for me. I had to cut, I had to cut about oh, six inches off the sleeves to get my arms in. <laughs> uh, I had to cut most of the way around the face to get my head in the hood. And I had to suck it And I don't know how I didn't put myself off because I used to go out even in summer and I was just hypothermic, really. Um, and I had these bright yellow fins and all the rest of it. Um, but what I did, I, I did the classic uh, thing that most new people start in spearfishing, I think, do, and I agonised over what gun I needed, and I spent um, days and weeks deliberating what type of gun I needed. I spent a fortune on this bloody gun that I just really carried about with me for two years and didn't really do much with it. It was just a, a cumbr- encumbrance, really. So, yeah, I think really getting to understand how to free dive as well, that was something that, I, I hadn't really researched too well, and I just went off and had a go on my own. <laughs> yeah. um, had a few uh, few problems with my ears and all the rest of it, so it, it took time. Um, but I think I, I didn't get a fish in my first year, probably. It's probably my second year I started, started getting fish. <laughs> uh, so I was you're, determined. You're, I was pretty determined. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say, you're a proper Spiro. Like, you're in miserable, cold, dirty conditions. Didn't shoot a fish for a year. You're a Spiro, like <laughs> pretty, pretty divided. Yeah. So, so when you, there's because there's not many people Spiro. There wasn't at the time anybody probably Spiro yeah. up here. You, you would get some strange looks in car parks as you're getting changed and all the rest of it. And you really felt <laughs> yeah, yeah. like a, a bit subversive somehow going out into the sea. <laughs> a big gun. Um, that I Oh, that's awesome. All right, so one year without a fish, uh, you've gone over numerous issues that you encountered. You finally got a gun that you like, I guess, and what was the sort of the first memorable fish that you remember shooting? There isn't one. <laughs> it was, it was, I, I really can't remember. It would be something completely unremarkable, like a, a little flatfish or something like that. I just I really can't remember that first fish. I've got a lot of memorable fish from you know more recently one most recent ones but um i think the first fish i just can't remember it um yeah it's probably a fig- well, give us experience <laughs> yeah. give, give us one that stands out that you're, you're kind of proud of yeah somewhere in your spearfishing journey yeah, um i mean there's been one this year that i think i'm it's probably been one of the best hunts i've ever done um it I, I'm starting to spearfish with a, a guy up here. He's, I think it's his second season, so I'm kind of. He's been going out a lot with me, and I took him to a spot that um, I used to dive years ago, and I hadn't have not been to it for a, well, maybe two or three years. And it's a really fishy spot. Um, um, you really need a kayak to get to it. It's quite. It's a bit of a paddle. So I went round to the kayak, um, and I used to have a plotter on my other that had all my fish spots on it and all the rest of it but of course I'd sold my kayak and I forgot to back up all my all the spots so I was trying to go from memory so I paddled around into this bay and there's quite a defined drop off in the bay 
it goes from a really nice kelp kelp bed down in the sand. Um, so you're talking maybe it goes from about four metres down to eight or nine metres on the sand, and it's usually got fish patrolling along that that weed line. Um, nice. And it, and it was just like it, it was almost like a, a textbook hunt because I found the spot immediately, jumped off the kayak, looked down, and there's a shoal of pretty decent pollock working along the weed line. But right at the back of the shoal, there was a a very big one. He, he, he looked, you know, maybe about 10 pounds from the surface. So that's a reasonable fish wow. by our standards. Mm. Um, so I grabbed the gun off the kayak and I swam back onto the shallows and, and I really just legged it as fast as I could for about 40 or 50 metres through the kelp and then back out onto the weed line. And I didn't really have time to breathe up properly or anything. I just dropped down um, and I was just caught the tail end of the shoal and so there's kind of five or six pound fish cruising past me and they were really relaxed um and the, they started getting bigger so i got a seven pounder and an eight pounder i'm thinking oh here he comes the big guy's coming and there was just nothing there was no more fish and i thought geez <laughs> I've, I've spooked it or something's happened but um just when i was starting to think the, the game was up the big guy appeared he was about three feet off my spear tip and i just stoned it um with uh, oh, okay. A pneumatic gun as well and I was having real problems aiming pneuma pneum my pneumatic gun at that point I was missing the most incredibly easy shots uh, so I had this going through my mind as well like don't miss don't miss but yeah it all came right and it was just just like a textbook hunt for me um, the fish I think was 10 and a half 11 pounds it was quite a solid fish oh, wow wicked nice, nice. So, and that what, what species was that that's a pollock uh, it's probably our most common fish I, I certainly I'm getting a bit um a bit obsessed with hunting them, really, because I'm I'm, I'm determined. I'm, I'm after a, a 15 pounder if I can get one, and uh, I think it, it's quite a it's quite an easy fish to hunt here. There's lots of them, um, and they're they're good eating, etc. So I tend to tend to go for them a lot. I think my mates are starting to take the mickey at me a bit because I've got a freezer full of the things now. But um, there are other fish about. <laughs> but, uh, I'm really getting into the, the Pollock hunting. So uh, are there uh, Scottish national records? Yeah, um, there's there's not so many spear fishing records, um, mm. but but if you look at rod fishing records for, for shore fishermen, um, some of the cod species we've got, you've got um, probably the three main ones are ling, which is ling cod. You sometimes see the Canadians talking about yeah. uh, cod and pollock. So the ling, you'll get. I think the records maybe about twelve pounds, something like that. Cod oh, is wow. about forty pounds. Um, and Pollock at the moment is about fourteen pounds. Um, mm. I, I think Ling, you know, I've had Ling up to five or six pounds, and Cod, I've I've never really. We find hunting a Cod here quite difficult because they're they're right in the kelp and they're they're very camouflaged. Um, I've I've never had a Cod over over five pounds. I've seen some reasonable ones, seven or eight pounds, but. Um, Pollock, we've certainly had Pollock up to 12 or 13 pounds as well. So, you know, there's a lot of those sort of species about. So the the cod are possibly difficult because the dirty water, the the sort of the, um, the 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 darkness in the kelp and the fact that the fish are camouflaged as well. They Do they get a bit smarter as they get larger as well? Yeah, I think it's like any fish to get, they get smarter. Um, the funny thing is I, I can go out in my kayak um, with a fishing rod if I want to and, and catch you know, 20 or 30 cod um, over a tide. But if you're diving for them, it, it seems to be quite quite a difficult uh, fish to actually target properly in the areas we're diving anyway. I mean, I always set out at the start of a year to say I'm, I'm going to crack the cod and go hunt for cod this year, but I just get distracted and go off and hunt pollock, really. I'm after, I'm after that. <laughs> <laughs> really, cod, cod trip is a bit of... It, it's, it's a bonus if I see when I'll get it, but... Um, I do don't your... think the right areas to, to actually really go go hunting for them. Are they deeper or? Yeah, they, they the tend cold? to be deeper. You get them at certain points of the tide and times of the year. They will come in quite shallow. When the sand eels are in, you'll get them in in very shallow water. Um, you'll see them at night as well. We do a lot of night diving over here, so you will see them more. You've got a better chance of seeing them at night. Um, but. You know, when you when you actually watch them in in the kelp, they're they're incredibly well camouflaged. As soon as they stop moving, they're quite quite difficult to see. Um, whereas you you look at some of these Norwegian videos, and they've got cod. Their cod seem to behave slightly differently. They're out in the open, 
Um, okay. And they behave, they look like they behave quite similar to our Pollock, but I think, I don't know if we've got a lot of seals here, and I don't know if it's anything to do with that. Maybe they, they um, you know, they stay in the kelp to keep away from the seals. I don't know. They're, they're uh, a bit of a mystery to me just now, but we've certainly got a few, but, but it's not, not something I intentionally go and hunt, really. Okay, cool. Um, I had a listener that sort of emailed into the show a while ago and he asked a question. He was going over to work in Aberdeen and he was asking questions about um, hunting European rock lobster and European clawed lobster. And he, and, he, and, and I sort of fielded that question on to you. Um, I'm a little bit more interested to hear about those species uh, in your area. Well, so what, what, have you, what sort of lobster have you got around you? Yeah, I mean the main the main ones the the European the clawed lobster. So it's got it's got the two big claws. It's got a, a, a crusher and a, a cutter claw. Um, okay. We do get the spinies, but but really it's quite a rarity, um, especially in this area. There's there's I've seen one or two and they've been very small. Um, okay. They get them out in the Western Isles out in the Outer Hebrides. They get some quite big ones, um, and I think. I might be wrong, but I think early summer, sort of May June July time, the the lobster potman actually target them out there i think they come in a bit shallower but um it's not something i've heard of people intentionally diving for um we were out in the outer hebrides me and a couple of my mates back in early summer and i was really hoping to try and find some up there but i i, I didn't find any at all so it's, it's mostly um the clawed lobster and they're quite common all right next question so next question in the show is what is your favorite hunting technique um how do you and and how do you apply it effectively? It's not, um, it's not going to be Pollock again, is it? <laughs> it's a Pollock hunting technique. Uh, I can give you a Pollock hunting technique. Yeah, uh, <laughs> really. I think, I like? think um, most of our diving here, we, we tend to do a speto, so we're we're diving into kelp or into holes in the kelp and letting the fish come come to us. Um, okay, uh, it's. It's probably the most successful way to hunt here. You're not going to chase the fish and catch up with them or anything like that. You've got to let them come to you. Um, and I think the, probably the a good tip for that is when you're doing it is I found that ankle weights are really, really good if you're going to be lying, lying in, your, in the kelp. The fish just absolutely hate fins flapping about, floating up behind you. If you've got carbon fins on, it's quite difficult to keep them on the ground uh, and not move too much so so the ankle weights really help hold them down um and i think that when you do that technique it sounds a bit obvious but if you shoot five pound fish that's all you're ever going to shoot because you tend to find that the, the five pound fish will come in first or maybe the two or three pound fish and then they'll get bigger and bigger so you've got to kind of get into that mindset of just letting these bigger fish and by uh, they'll always be there if, if you don't spook them they're not going to go anywhere um and just hang out for the bigger fish coming in um yeah. and i think if you you quite often see bigger fish kind of lurking in the background they'll not they'll not come in initially um and if you're going to surface i think when you surface just you know put the brakes on a bit when you get to the surface don't um, kind of breach and gasp for breath and clear your snorkel in the water etc come up as quietly as you possibly can um, clear the snorkel out of the water and then if you drop back down you'll probably find that the, the bigger fish are, are just that bit more confident and they'll they'll come in the second or maybe the third drop they'll, they'll come in and investigate so it's all about just being really quiet and, and getting as still as you possibly can be in that in the kelp that's a really really good hunting technique section there was a lot of good advice in there i was going to ask if um the fish in your area respond to burley um, I've never really, I've, I've done it, um, we, we have a lot of sea urchins here, which you don't want to land on a sea urchin when you drop down, um, I've, I've, yeah. I've put my knee on them a few times and they, they wreck your wetsuit and they're not good for your knee either. Um, they're good but, eating though. Yeah, they're okay, they're, they're not, nobody wants them here, I've got, a, I've got a Kiwi friend that's just mad for them, uh, I quite oh, often Yeah, me too. Eat. Um, my wife, <laughs> I'm, I'm not really so keen, but um, yeah, I sometimes we sometimes crush them up, but uh, yeah, it does help, but I'm not convinced it's really it's not a game changer. I don't think um, we've okay. not done a lot of burling, and I, and I know it's done elsewhere. But I think here, what the fish are they're they're they like visual attraction, so flashers do work, um, and they like okay. sound. But the burly side of things, I've never really gone too much into. It. Awesome. What about uh, 
you mentioned that you do a bit of night diving, mm. and I don't think we've ever spoken to anybody about night diving. So run us through uh, night diving, what you're targeting at night and um, sort of torches and, and how you go about that. Um, well, the thing about Scotland, I think, is in the winter we've got probably about seven hours of daylight. So really, if you want to spearfish through the winter, it's probably going to be at night because um, you know, you're working during the day. By the time you get home at half four at night, it's dark. Um, mm. So the main species that I'll go for at night is is lobsters. That's the, probably the best time to catch lobster. Um, or if you're looking for fish, things like ling um, and flatfish, if you're after flatfish like turbot, uh, which is a really nice eating fish, night time's a good time to get them. Um, so it's... It's got its dangers night diving, I guess. You've got to, the best way to start it is do it in an area that you, you know really well already because it's, it's so easy to get confused and lost, um, even in bays that you think you know, like the back of your hand. Um, so you've got to go in somewhere you're, you're quite familiar with. And what we used to do a lot was put a torch on the beach so we could we had a bit of a reference point because a, a lot of the areas we're diving, there's no houses or streetlights or anything. So you need to put something out there just as a, as a reference um, and from there, the torches, I think a lot of people seem to think you need a really, really bright torch, but actually that can put the fish off. If you're after fish, you don't want a really bright torch. You want something that's just enough to see um, and kind of don't shine it at the fish. You know, you, you shine it at the sand and let the reflection kind of illuminate around you. And you find that the fish oh, actually okay. light up. It looks like a bit of tin foil in the water, some of the fish. You know, they're, they're so bright underwater. But um, to be honest, I, I don't really spear fish too much at night. Um, yep. it's, it's, I mean, it's just a way of harvesting fish, really. If you want to catch a lot of fish, it's probably the way to do it. But uh, I prefer the fun of, of actually hunting during the day. But for lobsters, it's it's the way. So you're really just going through the kelp or through over reefs and you'll see them scuttling about. They don't light the torch either, so you've got to be quite careful about not not putting too much light on them, but just enough to be able to see them and, and grab them and make sure you're grabbing them the right way around. You don't want to get your hands in those claws because, you know, a big lobster can do you some damage. Mm. Uh, the fish, how do they, the actual fish... Are they a bit more docile and placid at night? Are they easier to approach? Yeah. You know, despite, I mean, yeah, yeah the, the, some of them get a bit twitchy, but if you approach it right, once you get the hang of it, I mean, I I go to the Channel Islands most years to the, the deeper blue um, spearfishing meet, um, and it's a totally different type of diving down there. It's nice warm water and it's calm and there's, there's not a howling gale all the time, and they've got a lot of sea bass down there. Um, I mean, you go out at night there, it, it's, you can swim right up to these things. It's quite incredible. Um, they're very, very relaxed. Um, what we find with our pollock up here, they tend to drop into the kelp a bit if you put the light on them, but they don't shoot off. You know, you can usually rummage about and you'll find, you'll find the fish. Um, and you'll see things like other species that you just don't generally see during the day. So you'll see squid and you'll quite often see octopus and things like that. So it's it's quite a nice experience to do. I really I really enjoy night diving. Um, you, yeah, cool. You quite often get a lot of phosphorescence in the water up here as well in summer especially. Oh, cool. So, you know, sometimes you do see fish actually swimming, lighting up the phosphorescence and you see these green glows oh. swimming out and all the rest of it. So, it's yeah, it's really cool. I, I love it. Yeah, right. And what about uh, sharks, mate? Sharks, um, we don't, uh, well, one of the, I have had a shark, um, pro not a problem, but I've had a shark, one shark experience in the UK, um, and that was at night, and, and it's the first time I'd ever come across a shark in the UK. We do have poor regal sharks here. You, you don't you don't really see them, though. Um, and uh, after my initial terror of sharks. I have been diving in South Africa since. I've dived with a lot of big sharks. I'm not really bothered about sharks out here. I think I've had problems with seals at night and I've I've, um, I've been more concerned about them, to be honest, than, than anything else. And what you see isn't really there anyway. So if the viz is terrible and the sharks are out past the viz, then they don't really exist. So Exactly. That's how Love it works. <laughs> All right. You've been, you've been spearfishing a while. Um, Surely you've had a scary moment. Uh, what what was that moment, and what did you learn from it? Um, well, it involved a shark, and it was at night. <laughs> 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 I, I can probably I can give you a couple of times that I've I've had 
problems. I think everybody's had a scary moment spearfishing, but um, that particular one for me with the shark, it, it, I was diving in Guernsey um, and we'd been diving an area called the Knife. It's quite, it's quite a reefy area. Um, and the challenge of diving out there is there's there's like a I think it's about a ten meter tide range they've got, so even during the day I was getting lost in this bit of reef. You'd look up and it, it suddenly there was islands where there wasn't islands before, or, or there was no <laughs> islands where you thought there was islands, etc. It's very confusing and there's a lot of current. So yep. I had the bright idea that if I went out diving at night, I could use the streetlights as a reference, and and that was fine. It was brilliant. So I went a bit further out than I probably should have pretty much out to the end of the reef and I was diving away and I looked up and it was a beautiful starry night and I thought oh, this is just amazing and uh, really loving it and I looked back at the shore and there was no lights <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of had a little bit of a panic just for a second or two and I thought I must be behind the rock a wee, a wee bit of poo yeah, a wee bit. Of, we could go into the poo story as well if you want. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's next. We'll, time. Get, to we'll yeah. get to that. We'll get to that. So back to the story. I, I kinda, it took me about a minute or so, and I realised they put the bloody, they switched the bloody street lights off, and so I was out there, and <laughs> I, hadn't, I really didn't have a clue where I was, and I knew I was in a current because I'd been diving in about seven or eight metres, and I was, I was fairly moving fast along the bottom when I was on the bottom. Um, and just as it dawned on me, I was actually lost. I had this, it was just a horrible feeling. I've never, never felt a feeling like it. I just felt sick almost thinking, you idiot, you've really screwed up here. And I had my torch on and this big shark swam below me. And at that point, I was really <laughs> thinking, oh, it's just, everything's just going absolutely wrong here. <laughs> um, and it wasn't that big, I guess. It was about six feet long, but in my mind, it just shouldn't have been there. And I really shouldn't have been there either. Um, yeah. So... It, it kind of went forward for a bit and out of, out of torch sight, which is actually probably a bit scarier because I just didn't know where it was or what it was doing. Um, and then it appeared back beside me on my right side, just just out the beam or just to the side of the beam. And, and it was actually quite cool. I realised it was it wasn't it wasn't threatening at all, and I wasn't actually bothered about it. It's quite a nice experience on its own, apart from being lost and panicking about getting swept out into the English Channel. Um, so. Uh, I got lucky, really, because I, the, I was in this big circular current. We used to call it the washing machine, and it, it just it gradually, I saw sand, and I was able to, from the sand, just sort of work out where I was. And I just never felt so relieved in my life to see sand, but I, I swam in, and um, I, I was absolutely, didn't have a clue where I was. Um, but I got onto the shore, and I was actually just at the same point I'd set off from. Um, so I, oh, that's right. Yeah, I was really lucky. It was a bit silly, but yeah, that was a, a scary moment um, for me. And I, I think what I learned from it was I went out quite quickly after that and I bought a, a handheld GPS chart plotter. Um, so I'm still night diving and I'm still solo night diving, but I've got a GPS now, so at least I'll not get not get lost. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we, ha we have an obligation to say, um, don't dive alone, particularly at night. All right, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Up here in Scotland, uh, I think probably the scariest thing I've had is, is a similar thing at night um, on moon again with... Uh, uh, <laughs> um, I was trying to uh, get some lobsters for uh, for Christmas dinner last year, and my mate had gone down to down to Wales to get scallops, and I said, "I'll go and get the lobsters." Um, and I went <laughs> in. I think I can't, it must be about you know a couple of days before Christmas. Uh, there was no lobsters where they should have been or where they normally are, so I swam around the headland into a, quite an exposed area where you, there's no exit point, um, and. I was suddenly aware of this massive grey seal beside me, and it was a big bull seal. And these things are, you know, the way the way about 250 kilos, and wow. it just sort of materialised within about two foot of me, and it it just was looking at me. Um, and I tried to swim, and every time I tried to swim, it was it was almost pushing me back into the shore. Um, and it it was obviously hurting me. It didn't want me in the water. Um, and I didn't really want to be there either. So I start, <laughs> started swimming back the way I'd came and he seemed quite happy with that. He was letting me do that, which was great. Um, but all I could see was this massive seal eye right beside yeah. me. Um, and he, he wasn't being aggressive, but he was being quite persistent that he wasn't going to let me um, swim the way I wanted to swim and he, I was going to get out the water. So I thought, yeah, we'll do that. Um, but then at that point, 
just when I was, I was probably about 100 metres off the beach and I was starting to think, actually, he's OK. I'm not, I've not got a problem here. Um, I got charged by a, a female seal, which is a bit smaller, but it had its teeth out and all the rest of it. And it was coming you know, at my face with its teeth and going underneath me. Um, and it was just it was just wild. I'd never seen a seal behave like it. And, and I really it was far more scary than being lost and having a shark for company because um, I thought this thing was really going to bite me. Um, but when I got out onto the shore, I, I realised there was a seal pup on the beach, and I think this is what it was all about. I was just in the wrong place, really. Um, but yeah, that was that was probably the most scary moment I've ever ever had. I think spearfishing, um, kind of five minutes of terror. I think just waiting to get bitten, but luckily I never I never did get bitten. <laughs> And uh, any takeaways from that? Not not really. I mean, sometimes you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time, I guess. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd looked on the beach to see if there was seal pups and I, I, I just had obviously missed it. But, yeah, I think I suppose the takeaway is just be careful um, around about November, December time when there are seal pups around. I think these, these seals do get a bit, a bit protective if you're out there just, just watching not in the wrong area, I think. Hey guys, today's Veterans Vault is brought to you by Cheryl Daly. That's right, Isaac's mum. And the reason it's brought to you by Isaac's mum, Cheryl Daly, is because she just bought a copy of what, Shrek? Yeah, 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. She said in her review, this is way better than buying chips from the shop. Yeah, she loves her fush and chups, that's for sure. But more than that, she loves throwing a feed of fresh fish straight in the chilli bin. So... Thanks, Mrs. Daly. So if you would like your own copy of 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing, where can they find it, Shrek? Go to Amazon.com and get your hands on some actionable information to improve your spearfishing. All right, next section of the show is a Veterans Vault, and this is the part of the show where we ask our special guests to take us deep into an area of spearfishing expertise, and uh, you have volunteered to talk about pneumatics. I also wanted to ask a bit more about your work and marine zones in Scotland, because I know that's an area of passion of yours. Can we, can we cover that off first, Grant? Yeah. Um, so, I, well, it's a bit of a long story. So there, there's a marine reserve that uh, is on the east coast of Scotland. It's a St. Abs and Eyemouth um, voluntary marine reserve. So the key there is, is voluntary. Um, and that was established about, about 30 years ago. Um, so it's, it's the oldest marine reserve in the UK, I think, but certainly in Scotland. Wow. Um, and I used to dive a lot on the, the boundary of this reserve and going back maybe six, seven, eight years, I used to get quite a lot of confrontation from you know, members of the public or, or wardens or, or commercial fishermen, etc. when they saw you out spearfishing um, because they, they, I think the, the, the comprehension of spearfishermen was we're going out and you know, killing everything that moved. And, you know, I was called an environmental vandal by somebody. You know, it, it <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite heated some of the discussions you'd have with people. And, and yeah, yeah. I, I got to the point where I, a few, uh, probably about two years ago, there was a bit of an incident with somebody. And I, and I just thought, I've had enough of this. I'm going to actually try and speak to these guys at the reserve and, and talk a bit more about spearfishing because one of the rules is there's there's no spearfishing and you know although we are not spearfishing in the reserve we're we're, we're sort of in the area we're, we're on the outskirts of it and i just want yeah grant don't don't worry i think it's a it's an australian pastime too to hang right on the edge of a what we call a green zone and just skirt it yeah and there's even a there's even a spot out here off brisbane and the uh, marine parks will do laps of that little green zone area and the spear fishermen sort of hang on the outside of it and drift around it. Yeah. So uh, I think it must happen the world over, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, no, I've, I've dived similar areas in South Africa as well. You know, it's it's a it's a bit of a magnet. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, I went and spoke to the um, the Marine Reserve and I met I met um, some of the staff there and, and really explained what spear fishing was about. And, and it was a great thing for me to do because I think there was a lot of misconception uh, comprehension about what we were doing. They, they thought there was a lot of danger in what we we're doing with the spear guns, etc. Um, and it was great to understand what they were trying to do as well. So, kind of fast forward, oh, a year, I found myself now 
I'm a trustee of the reserve. Uh, I'm, I'm treasurer <laughs> of the marine reserve. So it's <laughs> um, um, I, I, we've got a marine reserve with a, a spear fisherman as, a, as the treasurer. And I'm, I love uh, it. Oh, when can we come over? <laughs> so I'm working with a lot of environmental groups and, and bunny huggers, etc. I sometimes feel like I'm the, the fox in the chicken coop, if you know what I mean. So, um, I, I think I, I think, think hunters are the best best people for it. Like. Yeah. Oh, I really do. We have some uh, such a great awareness of of the environment. Like. That's right, and I, and I think the the great thing is we're we're all actually at the end of the day we want the same thing, and that's that's a healthy marine environment. Um, and I think the, the spear fishermen have got. I think we've got a great role to play in that because there's a lot of sort of citizen science projects and and um, ways that spearers or divers can get involved in. Um, logging species that have spotted or um, you know strange strange behavior or whatever and there's various formal ways you can do it various websites there's things like capturing our coast.co.uk which is one of the citizen science projects and really these things are all working towards getting the detailed population distribution or species distribution maps of marine species done for Scotland and looking at climate change and, and the effects of that etc so there's a lot of great stuff um, and in terms of the the marine reserve, um, I think it's got a real educational role, and, and I'm quite keen that we're able to to use that reserve to educate young people. And, and you know, we're looking at things like putting in a snorkel trail and all the rest of it to get people involved in the sea. And there's there's, oh, cool. there's various kind of touch pools and stuff that they can get involved, involved opportunities to do that. Yeah, it's, it's been it's been good. So it went from being quite confrontational, I think, to really I think there's some goods come out of it, and we're all we're all kind of singing from the same hymn sheet now. Yeah, oh, that's a credit that's a credit to you, Grant, as well. Like, sounds like you you put in a work. They're not um, not everybody saying spear fishing's great. Let's let's uh, let's welcome spear fishermen. But I think there's a, there's a bit of acknowledgement that we're not out there um, murdering the fish, and and also there's an increasing awareness that we we don't leave anything behind. You know, whereas a lot of and I wouldn't say that all rod anglers do this, but a lot of rod anglers are leaving behind, you know, line and hooks and beers and dead fish on the rocks and all that sort of stuff. And and that's probably where the problem area is in terms of, you know, recreational marine use is, is how to resolve those sorts of issues. Okay, cool. And so you've got a full time trustee role there now. I mean, is that is that your we your normal workers as well, well around no, this sort of field? It's a, it's a voluntary thing. So Oh. Um, this afternoon, I'm, I've got the day off work. So this afternoon, I'm um, finishing off a business plan and cash flow projections and all the rest of it for the reserve. But yeah, no, it's it's a voluntary thing completely. Wow, that sounds like a a solid undertaking. Yeah. Wow. There's a few there's a few points there. I think we could all do with getting them a bit more involved. So that was good to hear how you're getting involved in your area. So that's awesome. I I saw a study um, that's going out at the moment. Um, these guys are crowdfunding for um, great white shark research. They want to study the impacts of cage diving mm-hmm. uh, and as, as an industry and whether it changes shark behavior. Um, they're studying a group of great white sharks out of the Neptune Islands. I, it's pretty amazing. Like, and, and all of this research costs money, and a lot of them, they just want volunteer laborers. And like we sort of said before with your reserve, um, spearfishermen are in the area. We know the area. We know the species. We know the benthos, the topography. We, we understand, the, you know, our sort of an ecosystem and our impact on it. So I think we are well placed to get involved with these studies. So, yeah, yeah, cool. Absolutely. Um, and the thing that we found as well that I speak to a lot of scuba divers out there, and they're not seeing half the species that the free divers are seeing. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of noise associated with scuba. Um, so there's been a lot of assumptions about what species we have got, but I think we're probably going to find as time goes on and we get more more free divers involved in in logging species, etc. I think we'll find that there's probably a lot more out there than than we know. Do you guys call scuba divers bubble blowers in Scotland? Uh, we call them all so- all sorts, really, but yeah, bubble <laughs> would be the plate the plate description. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah wanna... there, there's there's a big um, our whole east coast is quite a big diving area, um, but for spear fishing, we really try and avoid where the scuba divers are because as soon as the dive boats come in, you actually see the fish moving off. You know, the, it's, there's so much noise associated with the, the scuba boats, but they've got lifts that drop the divers into the water and all the rest of it. Um, 
the bigger fish do move off, so we, we tend to try and keep away from them, apart from the fact that you don't want to be waving spear guns around scubas, really. They, they don't really like that for some reason. Mm. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move into a, another area of your passion and expertise because you've undertaken the change from rubber or yeah, banded yeah. guns to pneumatic guns. Um, what are the key differences that you've sort of noticed? Well, how do they work to start with? Yeah, how do they work? That's probably a good place to start. <laughs> um, well, for, I'll, I'll say I'm, I'm not an expert. I've, I've been using them for four years. I solely use them now. Um, but I would say that fundamentally they're, they're really all the same sort of basic design. You've got a, a tube, which is basically the outer barrel, which is usually a 40 millimeter tube, but it might be hydroformed to be a nice shape or something like that. And then in the inside of that, you've got a, an 11 or a 13 millimeter barrel with a piston in it. And, and to load it, you're actually putting the spear on that piston and pushing the piston back in to the gun. Okay. So you're basically compressing the air within the gun so you don't actually lose air every time you, you fire these guns it's just you're compressing the air within a, a sealed container if you know what i mean yeah um, yeah yeah right so you're the, the work at pressures from sort of 15 bar up to up to 30 bar um i, I think that loading the things can be a bit of a challenge if you're not used to it but it's, i suppose it's like, it's like loading a big band gun it's more technique than than anything else um I mean, my, my first one was a, what was it? It was a 115 centimetre pneumatic. And the first thing I did was put, I don't know why I did it, I put more air in it when I first got it. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> I felt, got as much in as I could, having never fired the thing in my life. And I went out and, and I, it was like, I just wrestled with this thing for about half an hour and I couldn't load it. The spear was all over the place and I just ended up having to get out and let some air out of the thing because I just physically could not load it. But um, it's more technique. Um, biggest challenge, I think, to me anyway, has been aiming the thing. Uh, they're very different to a band gun to aim. You've got you've got no sort of real spear overhang to speak of, so you can't actually see the spear when you're aiming at a fish. Um, and there's no sort of bands or, or spear to line along. You've got a sort of a round tube. Um, and I spent probably two years... I've never missed so many fish in those two years as I've missed in my whole spear fishing career. And, <laughs> and even missing fish that are absolutely impossible to miss, you know, three foot off your spear tip, I was missing them and, and all the shots were going high. Um, and interestingly, my, my friend, he's just got in, starting to get into pneumatics and he's having exactly the same problem. He's, he's you know, he's having impossible misses and, and can hardly hit a fish and all his shots are going high. And I think what actually happens is your brain's so used to, or your eyes are so used to seeing a spear when you come from a band gun. I think what you do with the, the pneumatics is you, you tend to tip the gun back a little bit so you can, you're then using the spear tip to aim and you're doing this sort of ah, subconsciously. Yeah. Yep. So actually the gun's, the gun's pointed in the air a little bit and you tend to fire over the fish. Oh. So when you're aiming it, it looks like it's a dead set. You can't miss, but actually you're miles off when you actually pull the trigger. So that that for me has been the the biggest problem by by far. But I've kind of I've cracked it now. Um, and well, and I, I said to my mate last week I was going to wait for him to miss a fish, and and I, I was going to lie beside him and then I would shoot it after he'd missed it. Just to it <laughs> so of course I went down in in front of him and. Uh, I missed my first fish. So I think I've not missed a fish. The last 35 fish, I've never had a miss and, and a clean missed a fish. But yeah, generally, I think they're really accurate once you get your eye in with them. I think they're uh, astonishing guns to use for reef fish. Um, very, very underrated. I think they've got a bit of a bad reputation amongst spear fishermen. Is it a... Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, recoil. Is there any recoil in them like there is a banded gun? No. Um, and that, that's... It's quite deceiving when you start using them because you actually think you pull the trigger and you there's a bit of a click, a tiny bit of recoil, and you think, God, was that it? There's not there's not much there. But um, the gun I use most is a Spore Sub One Air, so it's a 110 centimetre gun, and that's got a dry barrel and it's got a vacuum muzzle in it, which means that um, when you load it, there's no water going into the gun. So when that piston comes forward, it's not having to push the spear and a whole lot of water. It's just just pushing the spear out, which means you've got an incredibly powerful gun, but it's also very, very quiet. And literally when you fire that, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a click and the, the muzzle lifts a bit, but you've got a, 
a usable range of about you can take fish out to about seven meters with that quite quite comfortably. Oh. Um, it's got immense power. Um, wow. So for for spearfishing around about Scotland, it's a, it's a for me it's a, it's a good weapon to use because if you get the vis and you want to, you can have a bit of fun taking these long shots. I'm not saying it's a, that's not a way to learn to become a spear fisherman, but I think it, it's quite a, an enjoyable way to hunt fish, is taking, you know, sniping fish at quite long range and, you know, going for these bigger fish that are a bit more nervous. Yeah, yeah, no, that's perfect. I read um, I read a few different reviews and comparisons between the Bandit and Pneumatic Guns, and some of the guys were saying Pneumatic Guns were only really effective to use because of the difficulties with loading, to a, a fairly short length, like some of them mentioned like 70 to 90 centimetres was kind of like the maximum, but you're using a 110. Um, yes. Can you explain why there might be that sort of preconception? Yeah, I mean, they are difficult to load, um, as I say, but once you've got the technique, they're actually very easy. And, and I started off, I think the standard way of loading these bigger guns is you put the, you put the, <coughs> the handle, sorry, <coughs> you put the handle on your foot, and you hold on to the muzzle and then you stretch. So it's really as far as you can reach is probably as the big a gun as you can load. So in the case of a 115 centimetre gun, the actual length of that gun is going to be 115 centimetres from the, the muzzle to the handle. And then you've got another probably 115 centimetre spear there. So if you can't reach that, you're not going to be able to load it um, using that technique. But the way I load them uh, is I just grab the gun in the middle with my left hand um, put the spear in and then I put it between my knees and I just kind of curl my body up and pull the spear down. And I, it's quite an easy way to load them. I think I think anybody could load any size of gun doing it like that if you've got the strength to, to grip the gun and not let it slip through your hands. Okay, so, all right, so you've sort of given a good answer for how to get around some of the difficulties with the longer guns. What about noise, Grant? Are they? I've heard they're a noisy gun when they actually yeah. are fired. They're they're, they're incredibly noisy. Um, the first the, my first hundred and fifteen centimeter gun. Um, when I went, I took it out. My dive buddy was in a bay, and he was probably about five hundred meters away from me, and I'd missed about ten fish in about half an hour. And he and he <laughs> came across, and he said it was like a shotgun going off underwater. You know, he said that the noise was just incredible. Um, but the way around that, and, and I think I would do this, I've done it to all my uh, pneumatic guns, is to put a, a vacuum muzzle system on it, a dry muzzle, um, and that almost eradicates the noise. You know, the, the noise is really oh, yeah. the water getting blown out the front of the gun. So if you put these dry barrel kits on, that stops that. Um, so, you, so really you're getting that advantage of more power, uh, no wasted energy really, so you, you've got no noise coming out of the thing. Um, so, but, so if you were to, with the wet barrel, um, say mm -hmm. you're you're on the pollock, uh, you miss a shot, uh, loud enough to spook those fish, even though they're not an easily spooked fish? Oh, yeah, they, they, they definitely don't like it. I mean, it's like all fish, I guess. The smaller fish, the five, six pounders, they'll kind of, they'll spook a little bit, but they will come back. But if you do that with some bigger fish around, they're not going to hang about. They'll just be off. They just know something's not right. Um so uh, none of my guns now are, are wet barrels. They're all they're all dry barrels because um, it, it's also helping you load because you don't have to have such a high pressure in the gun to, to load it to get that power. Okay, so that brings me to my next question. I was going to ask you sort of what to, you know, what are the things to look for when you buy a pneumatic gun? These dry dry barrel kits that you're talking about, are they a conversion that you do to a wet barrel gun or do you just buy a gun that's a dry barrel? Yeah, setup? there's a bit of both there really. There's, there's a few dry barrel guns on the market. The one I use is the, is the Spora Sub 1 Air, so that's all good to go. Um, and that's set up with a, a what they call a free shaft, so it's got a, it's not got a rear tied spear, it's got a hole through the, the spear up near the flopper uh, where you tie your line on. And it's all okay. it's all set up as a dry barrel, and the seals are actually in the muzzle. Um, there's other ones you know, Salvamor make uh, off the off the shelf dry barrel guns. I've got a Salvamor Vuto. It's probably I think it's about four years old, and that's a dry barrel gun. And its its system is it's got a slider on the spear, but it's got a kind of rubber cuff inside the muzzle that seals around the spear when you load it. Do you find the slider system uh, has a slower spear, or like it slows faster and has less range? Not, not really. No, I mean, the, 
I prefer the, the, the free shaft now. I, I was really, I didn't like the idea of it. I thought it would affect accuracy, but it really doesn't. I think the big difference for me is if you shoot a fish with the, the free shaft set up, um, more often than not, if it's if it's less than five metres away, your spear's actually going to go through that fish. Um, so instead of relying on just a, a flopper, you've actually got the line going through the fish and you've got the spear is actually, you know, T-barred up against the fish, so you've got like a giant flopper, you know, of your, your spears getting pulled uh, onto the fish, so that it really can't get off. Um, the the slider system, the disadvantage that I find is it makes a big hole in the fish, um, and yeah. sometimes I've had flopper failures purely because you know if you put a, if you've not had a good shot, maybe in a soft area in the fish, you've you've blown a pretty big hole through that fish, and and sometimes the floppers just don't get a grip, so. Yeah, I really prefer that that front-mounted um, line system. It's, it's far better. Yeah, okay, nice. What else when you're purchasing a gun? Someone's going to purchase a gun, what would you sort of tell them? Would you Have you got some brands you stick to or what are the features that are kind of just essential apart from the dry barrel? Yeah, I think um, the thing I would look at is the triggers because um, a lot of these pneumatic guns, the older designs, the triggers are just, they're horrible. They're really not nice to use. They're, it's like, there's no feel. They're really, really stiff to pull. You almost think the safety catches on before the thing goes off. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and a lot of them have line releases that are actually under the trigger. It's like a, almost like a mechanical. It's like a cam, uh, and the line's tripped off the. When you pull the trigger back, it lets the cam go, and the, the little plastic the line release goes forward. Um, some of those ones have got just this, you know, really bad triggers. Um, so I think guns like the Omer Air Belite. Uh, Spora Sub One Air, some of the Salvamar guns have got better triggers as well. And I think all of the guns are really powerful and I think you'll get accurate with any of them as well. But the one thing you can't fix is a, is a, a dodgy trigger. So I'd really look at what the triggers are like because um, it, it's going to make the difference between having an accurate gun and, and a, and a kind of so-so gun. I dare say you'll get used to it, but it's just not a nice thing to use. Yeah. Okay, so how long did it take you to adapt total to the pneumatic gun and to be effective and accurate with it? <laughs> uh, probably about four years. <laughs> um, I, I think the mistake I made was I kept going back to my band gun. So I would go out and I would sicken myself with the pneumatic. In fact, I got to the point where I was taking two guns out. I was taking a pneumatic and a, and a band gun out, and I would miss a few fish, and I'd go back to the band gun. Um, this year I decided... I was going to just use the pneumatic because I thought there's. A, I'm just. I really need to concentrate on it and get used to it because there's. It's. It's really. If you think about, it, it's a fully enclosed track gun, and it's super mm. consistent. You've got a, a, an unvariable uh, power source, so it's exactly the same pressure all the time. So there's no reason it shouldn't be accurate. So I, I kind of persevered with it, and it, it, it's taken a long time. Um, I'm actually scared to pick up a band gun now in case I, in case I lose my my pneumatic aiming skills again. <laughs> um, I went through the same thing with uh, when I converted to a roller gun. Oh yeah, in the Coral Sea, I I took a few shots, didn't like it, or found it hard to load. Went back to my rubber gun, but it wasn't as good as the roller, and yeah. did this sort of half a foot a foot in half, and uh, you know, and then re at the end of the day, I just got rid of the um, the band gun, stuck with the roller, and um, I'd never go back. Yeah, yeah. So there's one of my mates has done exactly that with the roller as well. He's uh, I think he was. He said he shoots, is it, you shoot low with an ordinary band gun or is it vice versa? I can't remember. But anyways, he's converted all his guns to rollers now because he, he couldn't switch between the two at all, he was saying. I think it's hard to uptake new technology, particularly with spear guns, because you, you get your eye in, you get your technique in, and it's formative. Like, so to change technology to adapt to something new is like quite a hard experience. And you yeah. see it time and time again, like guys can't even switch from – aluminium barrels to carbon barrels or or aluminium to wood barrels you know like and it seems like such a small change because it's the same design same sort of um you know diameter bands and all the rest of the same length of gun but it's just you know even just this thing, sim yeah, simple the, thing like a stock is hard to change the thing if you're yeah. a roller you don't have to compensate anymore it just shoots where you point it and that's yeah. the biggest thing so it's like everything else you've, you've got to have total confidence in, in the gear you're using and, and if you find yourself thinking about how you're going to aim that gun well you're probably going to miss because really I think that you just want it to be such a natural thing um, I, I, I'm not consciously aiming a gun a band gun or a pneumatic I'm just kind of looking at the fish and pointing the gun 
and I, I'm just looking at where I want to shoot it. I don't, if I start thinking about it like I was doing with the pneumatic, I'm going to miss because it's, it's my head's not got, it's got, got round what I'm actually doing with it, I think. So it does take time. There, there's, there's the two different sort of shooting styles too. Like you get the guys that like to look straight down the barrel and then there's field shooters as well. And so there's a couple of different styles there that have to adjust in different ways as well. All right. I've got one last question for pneumatics. Um, who do you think these guns uh, are best suited for? What conditions and maybe depths? Uh, oh, sorry, there was one. There was one other <coughs> preconception that I've heard. Um, these guns lose their effectiveness in depth. Is that is that your perception? No, uh, I think there's a bit of misconception there, and, and I think they do lose. I'm not into the science of it all, but I think. I have heard they lose one bar every 10 metres or something that you go down. But really, if you think about it, you're, you're using a gun that's got 25 or 30 bar in it, you're going to have pretty <laughs> deep before you're worrying about losing power, I think. Um, yeah. So we we don't really dive, or I don't dive deep here. I think most of my fishing's under 15 metres. I'll sometimes go at 20 metres, but I've never I've never felt the gas gun is is lacking in power at all there. Um, I, I, don't, I think it's a paper... It's, on paper, it might be an issue, but I think in the real world, it, it's not anything to worry about in the least. Um, okay, cool. Who, who and, the guns are suited to, I think, for our sort of diving here, where you've got reef fish uh, in the sort of depths I'm talking about, and potentially you're going to have fish up to 15, maybe 20 pounds if you really hit the jackpot, but I think realistically up to 15 pounds. Um, I think the pneumatic guns are just absolutely perfect for that sort of hunting um one of my other my smallest pneumatic is a 70 centimeter it's also a spore of sub one ear so it's a tiny little gun uh but it's got a range of it's got an effective range of about uh, five meters uh, so it's got four wraps of line on it and a reel and it'll strip a few feet of reel uh, line off the reel but in, in hunting kelp etc you've you've got a really maneuverable uh gun with a super fast spear shot so a lot of the time we're hunting in, in quite fast current, um, and a gun like that 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 is has got the reach and it's got the speed is is really effective. I actually have one more question. How long does it take you to reload it? So you 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 drop down on your school of Pollock, you shoot at your fifteen pounder that you don't very see very often, and your turbo, so you miss. Uh, how long does it take you to reload that Classic gun? Classic turbo. <laughs> Classic turbo. I can, tell, uh, I can tell you exactly, and this sounds a bit strange, but 40 seconds. Um, oh, really? I know, <laughs> I know that because um, a few weeks back I shot, I got into a shallow area, it's about four metres, and it was full of pretty big fish. Um, and I shot one um, off the surface, which is really really unusual for Scotland. I don't tend to do that. They do a lot of that down the south of England, but um, I shot a fish and I reloaded the gun and I shot another one and I had a quick glance at my watch because I'd, I'd had a bit of a dive. Uh, I'd surfaced, started reloading, and when I fired the gun, it was 40 seconds later from from loading, you know, starting the loading cycle of firing, it was 40 seconds. So they're very, very fast. Um, right. I, I've done it a few times where I don't string the line. I just shove the spear in and, and fire um, but you've got to be careful because especially with a big gun you've got six odd metres of line floating about you and I have had it catch the back of my leg and it gives you a fair old a fair old thump if it gets you so you know you're better probably taking your time and stringing it properly and that's maybe going to take you a minute if you're in a hurry I think yeah that's that's pretty interesting, actually. What Shrek did there with his little <laughs> his little call there, there is, uh, there he pointed out that I miss fish, but he actually paid me a compliment by saying that we're in 15 metres, so I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> See what you did there? Um, <laughs> and I, and no. I think that, that ease of loading as well, they're great guns for using at night um, because they're so easy to load. Uh, so I've got a little, a little one that I use at night, and I, I don't have, I think I've got, two wraps of line on that and it's just so quick and easy to load whereas the band gun at night can just be it can end up in a bit of a mess really if you can't see what you're doing properly well i learned something today in fact i learned several things about pneumatic guns so i think that was a excellent veteran's fault have you got any more questions Tabo? No, I think that about covers it. I'm just happy that you actually acknowledge that I can dive to 15 metres. So it's been a good day. Right, I catch you later, Grant. <laughs> 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 All right, good segue. The funniest thing, Grant, what's the funniest thing you've experienced out spearfishing? 
Um, I was, there's, there's a few things, but um, I was going to talk about my mate Ian, uh, also known as the Hobbit, um, who's always, <laughs> yeah. always first to get ready. And you know, by the time you've parked your car, he's he somehow managed to get into his suit and got out there. But I didn't really want to embarrass Aww. him and talk about the time that he put his trousers on backwards and he couldn't understand why everybody was <laughs> just hosing themselves at him. Um, so I'll not, I'll not talk about Ian putting his trousers on backwards. Um, <laughs> uh, I think. Probably one of the funniest things I think was um, night diving again, but this time I went with a friend, uh, and we were in a quite a big uh, military area that sometimes it doesn't allow boats access or anything like that. But um, on this occasion, you could you could do what you liked. It was open, so me and my mate went out night diving. We're looking for lobsters, and we had our we used surface floats. We've got kind of um, banks board type floats at the time. Uh, and each had an LED light on them. So mine had a, a green and his was red or something like that, just so we could keep in touch with each other, really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Morse code. So we went, out, we went out into this this military area, and it was a lovely, lovely night uh, with the, the dive torches, obviously. Um, and we had a we had quite a, a reasonable night. But what we hadn't realised was there had been a gathering crowd on the shore who had seen the dive lights and the little LED uh, lights on the floats. And in true X Files fashion, because they're in a military area, they they decided that oh. it was a UFO. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and I think they've been drinking. It's quite late. You know, it was about one o'clock in the morning. But we were speaking to these guys later, and and they, they were on the point of phoning the police or the army. So, um, <laughs> I to think what would happen if they phoned the army and said there was a UFO in the bay. Uh, so oh, yeah, it was quite awful. quite entertaining. I think they just thought we were off our off our heads, really going out going out diving. Um, that's that same B. I'm, I should really call it comedy B because I've had a few few funny funny things happen in there. But uh, about a month ago, I was night diving out there as well on my own, and the fishing was rubbish. There was just not much about, and but it was quite a nice night. So um, I, I had, had had my torch off. There was a lot of phosphorescence, and I, I just started working my way in to 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 get out really at the exit point, and I'd taken my fins off, and I was in about three feet. The water, and um, it's a big shallow bay, so it's, the last sort of hundred meters is, is kind of three feet, and I was just kind of pushing myself along on my toes, um, and I got to the beach and I stood up as you do, and there was just all hell let loose, and, and it sounded like I've got a three and a half year old little girl, and it sounded like um, a grown man version of that screaming. This guy was screaming in a high pitched voice. He'd been out fishing, and he hadn't seen me coming in. I had no lights on at all, and I'd stood up actually in front of him. <laughs> so, um, he, he, gave, he gave hell of a fright as well, and he, and he sort of he was reversing up the beach, running as fast as he can, and, and I put a punch on him. And uh, it looked like he was swatting flies in front of his face and screaming. <laughs> and I think I maybe like a bit of a, a bit of a girly scream as well. I think we both got a hell of a fright. But um, yeah, it was great. You know, I think I saw him the next day, and he just he, he could hardly speak to me. He just he wasn't very happy. I think he thought I'd done it on purpose. <laughs> old Messi was coming back. Uh, that's good. So you were so. An unidentified swimming object, and then then Nessie, good yeah. stuff. Yeah, the noise he made for really was quite quite impressive. It was uh, he went on for about a minute just screaming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought it was like a ten second, like Turbo does, no, no, a whole no, minute. It's up the beach, bad. swatting flies in front of his face. Hyperventilating. <laughs> 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 All right, mate. Uh, why don't you run us through? Uh, What's in your dive bag uh, in terms of all the gear? And, uh, yeah, feel free to name brands and tell us why you like those products and um, why you use them. Okay. Um, where will I start? I'll start my feet, I guess. Um, so I use Pathos uh, Full Carbon Pro Spearfishing Fins um, mm. in, in a hard layup. I think with the Pathos Fin Pockets as well, they're just – I find them so comfortable. Um, and they're, they're – it's a very soft rubber foot pocket, but I think diving here in the cold water is that they're they're perfectly suited to that because they, they don't get too hard. You know, I used to find the Omer foot pockets got quite hard in the cold water, whereas these things are just great. Um, socks, I think we, we're using five mil socks all year, so I'll, I'll use them in uh, any temperature. So sometimes your feet get a bit cold, uh, sometimes you can't feel them, and sometimes they get a bit warm, but. <laughs> Mill socks, that's just what I use. Um, <laughs> I use, I, th I think the spider, Omer, I think they're called spiders. They've got a, a kind of grippy coating on them. Um, they, uh, 
they don't slip about in the fin and I find them quite good. I used used to use open cell socks all the time, but I'm struggling to get decent ones these days. But I think these Omer spiders are a good a good replacement. Um, cool. Always dive with a half kilo ankle weights on each each ankle. I think that's just going back to not not spooking the fish really when you're on the bottom. Um, wetsuits. I think this is where I've spent a bit of money on wetsuits over the years, but but really all all I use now are um, Elias made to measure wetsuits. So I've got a five, a seven, and an eight millimeter. So that'll do me all year basically. Those those three sizes. So so I'll be diving from kind of sixteen degree water down to four degree water temperatures, um, and that'll wow. cover the lot. Uh, my mask. I think that's an over. It's an over zero. I think it is. Um, it's it's just a mask. Um, it's got a torch. I always have a torch from a mask strap just for looking in holes or or when you're night diving to have a bit of to have your hands free if you want to do something. So um, how do you how do you sort of hold the torch on there? Is there like a dedicated mask strap to hold the torch on? I'm I'm assuming it's on the opposite side to your snorkel. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have a snorkel on my left and this torch on the right. I think it's is it a it's a, called a mini Q E L D, I think it is. It's, it comes with a mass strap. It's quite heavy. It's got four um, AAA batteries in it. Um, but oh, you, wow. you do get used to it. Um, so I tend to have that on all the time. And even for day dives, it's quite handy just for looking in holes or whatever. Or if you do get caught out and it's it starts getting dark, at least you know you've got a torch there if, if you need it. Um, yeah, nice. So floats, I think that's another area I've spent a fortune over the years on various floats. Um, at the moment, I'm using a, a Boshat Guardian float, which is um, you know one of these big jobs that you can lie on and, and swim with. Uh, used to use a Banks board, but the Banks board is it's the same idea, but um, it's solid plastic and really getting in and out of cars is, is a bit of a, a problem for me. So the Boshat's... Uh, inflatable so it's quite a it's quite a good float it kind of doubles your swimming speed if you get on the float and start swimming it'll, it'll double your speed so for longer swims it's, it's great we use those the same float i think um is it about a 25 liter or something no this, this thing's it's it's bigger than that it's um probably about a meter long and oh wow oh, 60 centimeters wide maybe you, you actually lie on top of it oh wow okay <laughs> So it's got storage and all the rest of it on it. So, so really, sometimes we're swimming fairly long distances. I think last Sunday we were. It was a five and a half kilometer swim. So, these things really make the swim a lot easier. So, do um, you store your fish on top of the float, or do you um, just use like a fish keeper on off the float? I just I just, I just use a stringer hanging off the float. Yeah. But sometimes nice. we get problems with seals. I have had seals try to tow the float away with the fish on. So if you get that, obviously just chuck them in the in the float. Okay, um, cool. So weight belt, uh, I don't know what my weight belt is, and, and, a, and a harness. I think I, I, I get a sore back, so I, I really need that weight harness just to distribute the weight. Um, yeah. So I use a seat harness. I've tried a few harnesses, and I think the seat one seems to hold its shape best. And then what else have I got? Dive watch. I, wouldn't, I never used to dive with a dive watch until maybe four or five years ago. Um, now I hate diving without it. I just I just don't feel fully dressed unless I've got the dive watch on when I'm out there. Um, so that's pretty much it. And five five millimeter gloves, pretty much all the year as well. Uh, and again, sometimes it's too warm. Sometimes you can't feel your hands, but generally they're they're kind of okay. <laughs> <laughs> we've uh, we've seen one of your videos too. So you're using a GoPro a lot of the time as well. Yeah, yeah. I've been trying various mounts, whether it's on the gun, and I think. What I found with the this using using the pneumatic, especially that big pneumatic with the, the GoPro in the back of the gun, um, the fish look like they're miles away because they are miles away off them, and you're shooting them with that that gun. So I've tried um, you know head mounts and all the rest of it, and recently I've started using a wrist mount. And I think I really like the wrist mount. I think you can get quite a quite a good view with that. Mm, okay, I've heard some similar stuff. I haven't I haven't tried one myself, so we'll have to have a go at that. Yeah, the only the only thing I've have found is it gets a bit confusing sometimes when you're tracking a fish with your left hand and you then start putting the spear gun onto it with your right and just trying to keep it all coordinated. And you know, I do find myself thinking I'm gonna shoot with my left hand and stuff like that that I've never done in my life. But yeah, it can get a bit confusing. In today's dive bag with Grant Laidlaw, we discussed pneumatic spear guns. And if that's piqued your interest in pneumatic spear guns, visit spearfishing.com.au for a full range of pneumatic spear guns. 
And if you spend over $200, use the code NoobSpiro at checkout and you'll save yourself $20. All right, cool. Next section, fast five facts for noobs. So five sort of fast, actionable pieces of advice that you would have liked starting out spearfishing all over again. Probably the first thing for me is um, I wish I hadn't got so wound up about what gun to buy. I think I, I wish I'd known that the wetsuit was really an important thing that I should be spending my money on and, and thinking more about. So I think um, just... Probably for most people, the gun's just going to be an inconvenience to carry about. And really, if you do get a fish that comes to present itself for a shot, it's it's probably on a suicide mission and the gun's really irrelevant. It um, doesn't matter what you've got. <laughs> uh, yeah, spend, spend the money on a good wetsuit. Because if you're comfortable, the more time you can spend in the water, the quicker you'll become a, a good Spiro, I think, uh, and be comfortable mm. there. Good point. Um, nice. But two, I think, learn, you hear this a lot, but learn how to relax and, and move slowly and slow down even more you know get get used to swimming with fish i think if you look like a predator the fish certainly the bigger fish are not going to come anywhere near you um if you're if you're down there in the bottom looking like a, a jedi waving a lightsaber about <laughs> you know it's just an arm belt to a fish um they'll, they'll come nowhere near you and you, you, you know you hear people saying that they've got a 75 centimeter gun but if they had a 90 they'd be able to get the fish because they're just not coming close enough but you know, if those same people got a 90 centimeter gun, they'd then be saying, oh, I need a 105. And that's just because the fish can read their body language. So I think, you know, really get used to being comfortable and slow. Um, and I think one of the best things I did was actually start diving without a gun because I realized I'm carrying this gun about and it's just it's just a, a pain, really, because uh, I'm not using it. And as soon as I started diving without the gun, I found the fish started coming in. And I learned a lot from that just behavior and how to how to get the fish comfortable around you and then start diving with the gun again and you'll start getting fish no problem awesome all right tip number three um, what was that tip number three i don't know when i'm oh, uh, two. <laughs> okay. two. No, don't, don't give him any freebies nah, no freebies today <laughs> sorry grant <laughs> uh, i think weights waiting get your getting your waiting right i think i Kind of picked up early when I was starting. There was a lot of free diver talk that you had to be neutrally buoyant at 10 meters, so I kind of aimed for that. But really, a lot of the hunting is if you're hunting at eight meters, it's no point being neutral at 10 because you're going to be holding on to bits of kelp that's going to snap off, or you'll find you've got a bit of kelp with a rock on the end as you're, you're floating to the surface. Um, and the fish are going to be quite quite aware that you're flapping about, so it's really get the weight right. I think. Don't don't be scared of weight. It's not it's not something to be. Don't overweight yourself, but you know just just practice getting it right. Um, nice. I, I do quite a bit with uh, I, I, because we're diving at such variable depths. I, I quite often have a, a, a couple of kilos on the float, and and I will attach that to my float line. So sometimes I can just hold it in my hand. I'll, I'll hold two kilos in my hand for diving shallow, and then I can drop that off if I'm going to go deeper, etc. So a bit of a just get used to changing your weight and using weight differently for different diving situations. Yeah, I like that. We do something similar. So when Turbo's taking on, you know, his maximum go. depth, you know, sort of 14. No, no, it's 15 metres, mate. You can't take it back. Yeah, it's 14.8 metres. <coughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll swim him down to eight or nine and uh, and then he carries on. From He's got there. very soft hands, Grant. Very <laughs> soft hands. Well, I've heard that, yeah. <laughs> from a complete lack of any physical work. <laughs> Scared of it. You've never seen a bloke leave so fast when it's time to fill up fish and clean a boat. Oh, oh my God. No, no, you got to no. save your energy for the day after yeah. carrying turbo but on the does podcast. Does he actually have fish to fill it, or <laughs> not usually? <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> oh, you doubled on me. Nice one, righto. Tip number four. Four. Oh, um, I think without without restricting yourself, get get to know a particular area really well, and and get used to diving it in um, different conditions, different tides, etc. Um, and and I think push yourself a bit in the conditions you'll go out in. You'll get, get used to going out in bigger seas. It's the only, it's the only way to learn. Um, but if you've got that confidence in, in kind of knowing the area, um, you can gradually build things up. And I think the important thing from that is you'll you'll learn how the fish behave at, at different states of the tide. Um, and I think these days I don't have the luxury of diving at the best times. You know, really here the best time is is on a flood tide when there's as much tide running as you can get. I'm, not lucky enough to be able to go out every time when it's like that. So 
if I find myself out there at slack water, it's probably the worst time to be out there. But I know I know how to find the fish and hunt them. So I think, yeah, just put the hours in learning an area and, and learning how the fish behave. And, and you can translate that anywhere, I think, as you dive and start moving, dive in other areas. It's really good advice. All right, fifth and final. I don't know if this is really a tip, is it? Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, I think just spearfishing is really about putting fish on the table, really. Uh, so I think once you've gone through that that mission of actually learning how to dive and move with fish and actually shoot fish, etc., it's really important to learn how to look after them, prepare them to get the best quality meal that you possibly can get out of the fish. So I think what I do uh, is I gut everything pretty much as soon as I've shot it. It's, it's gutted before it goes on the stringer. I've bled. I usually bleed the fish as well. Um, and literally as soon as I can get back, it's it's filleted and it's in a freezer. Um, I've got a freezer that I keep in my a fifty litre freezer in the car. So if we are away on a trip, um, the fish are getting piled into that freezer. Um, I think and one of the things I've come I've come quite late to this, but I've I've discovered vacuum packing just the last oh, few yeah. months. Again, that makes you such a difference quality. Good you, stuff. You, you must have listened to the last podcast episode, one hundred and one well, caring for your catch. Yeah. I, <laughs> It was one of my mates actually got the vacuum pack and I thought this was a bit gimmicky and we were away up north and I used it and I noticed there was such a difference between the fish with vacuum packed and the fish with, that I just bagged and frozen. Um, vacuum packed fish are a lot firmer, there's a lot more flavour. Um, so yeah, so I think it's not so much a tip but just really you've gone all that effort of learning how to spear fish. I think put the effort into um, learn how to look after that catch and respect the, the fish, you know, get, get a really good quality meal out of it. Awesome. All right, I'm going to sum them up for you. So tip number one, get your priorities right, spear gun or wetsuit. That was kind of what I wrote down. You said like, particularly up there in cold water, get your wetsuit right. Um, spear gun, spear gun comes later. Uh, yep. Tip number two, learn how to relax and move even more slowly. Uh, tip number three was waiting and get it right. Now, a lot of these tips seem to be highly relevant for sort of cold water diving, but they are all transferable as well. So, like, uh, tip number four: get to know an area really well. You talked about, you know, going out in a variety of conditions. And tip number five: put fish on the plate, but um, and, and enjoy sort of learning that part of it and and caring for your catch. And and I think you said listen to No Spirit podcast episode thirty eight. Pretty caring sure I heard that as yeah. well. Big yeah, yeah, that's thirty eight. Yep, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I was waiting for him to say what podcast? What are we doing? Yeah, it's uh, No Spirit podcast turbo. So good stuff. <laughs> All right, no, that's awesome. I got I got heaps out of that. All of it. All right, where are we at? Shrek? So we can link up. Uh, some of your videos in the show notes, Grant. What else would you like some of our listeners to come and have a look at? I think, um, really, I think going, going back to what I was talking about, about the, the kind of marine reserve and conservation side of things, I think have a look at getting involved in some of this citizen science stuff and, and looking at, um, certainly in Scotland, I think there's, there's global citizen science projects, but in Scotland, you know, capturing our coast.co.uk and some of these other um, sites, I think, it's well worth a look and and because we are seeing stuff out there that other people aren't seeing and i think it would you know it's good for us to be, get some recognition for 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 that sort of wildlife that we're seeing and, and being able to help help scientists actually log what, what climate change etc is doing at the moment perfect all right i'm going to chuck the link you've just mentioned in there what was that a uh, capture the sorry the Capt uk link? Uh, capturing our coast.co.uk is one of them but i think if you just Google citizen science, uh, wherever you are, you'll find various different projects. Um, the other one that a lot of spear fishermen are kind of picking up in Scotland, we, we've got a, there's a Facebook group called Spearfish Scotland, uh, and there's been a bit of promotion on that as well, about you know picking up three pieces of litter when you're out there and all that sort of thing. And I think, yeah, just just be seen to be looking after the environment and becoming you know seen as a sustainable spear fisherman, not some um, camoed up fish murderer that I think a lot of people think we, we really are. Yeah, awesome. That's great. Love it. All right, Grant, that's uh, that's a fan, that was a fantastic interview. I, I liked all of it. There was so much stuff there that we have not heard before. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I love heaps of the cold water sort of actionable um, information. It was just just phenomenal. I think you should perhaps look up uh, starting to teach other guys over there how to get into spearfishing in Scotland. Uh, you've got a, a real gift for teaching, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a big interest over here. There's a, there's a, and there's always people looking for um, buddies, etc. And I think 
there, there definitely is potential in Scotland to start doing something. I think there are a few experienced guys about, and I think it's probably something that we should start looking at as a group to start um, encouraging young guys coming through because it really isn't, it's not an easy sport to get into over here. It's pretty miserable, <laughs> to be honest, yeah. uh, to start with. I think no matter where people are, it's a very steep learning curve. I mean, we've made a whole podcast about it and some of the different facets to it. So I've really enjoyed talking to you about, um, you know, what spearfishing is like in Scotland. It's, it's great to have someone from over there. So awesome. Thanks for joining us, Grant. Cool. No, thanks. It's been good. Thanks, guys. Cool. Thanks, Grant. Thanks for joining us for today's episode with Grant Laidlaw. We hope you got a ton of value out of it. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. Um, Really interesting stories there. Diving at night in Scotland sounds absolutely amazing. Uh, This episode is our last for 2016, so we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we will be back on the 4th of January in 2017 with Jose de Barca from Spearheads. And we speak to him all about... Um, creating films and editing and all that good stuff to uh, help you make better films when you go spearfishing. So uh, we hope to see you then in the new year. Thanks for listening. Guys, if you're on the hunt for some new equipment, check out Adreno Spearfishing Supplies at spearfishing.com.au. They have a huge range of gear. They've got great prices. And if you use the code NOOBSPIRO at checkout, you'll save yourself $20 on all purchases over 200 So check them out at spearfishing.com.au and use the code NOOBSPIRO at checkout. Thanks for joining us today, guys. We had a ball bringing you the show. We always do, and it's just, as usual, jam-packed full of good information for the Noob Spiro. Now, if you'd like to connect with us further, do yourself a favour and get on our email newsletter. That is full of the happenings and goings on around Noob Spiro, and it's got some great deals in there for you as well. Now, if you are a hardcore fan or just a fan or you need a new shirt, go to noobspiro.com and check out our range of shirts. We've got some great stuff there from sizes from... Turbo to Shrek. Turbo to Shrek. Yep, and everything in between. And Shrek, what can they do if they want to become truly better at spearfishing? Go to Amazon.com, get your hands on our ebook, 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. It's actionable information drawn from over 10 years spearfishing experience between Turbo and I, and some of the best information we've learned from more than 40 interviews from spearfishing experts around the world. Also, guys, just quickly, leave us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. It helps other people find the show. Thanks for listening, guys. We hope you get a couple of PBs this week.